ready to go. Great. All right, well, let's get started with the first item. Um, <clears throat> so I can't see the script, but um, I can start with the first item, approving meetings from April 12th. We have to call roll first. Or first roll call, that's right. Ginger, if you could call, roll call, please. <laughs> All right, Trustee Cortez. Here. Trustee Hahn. Here. Trustee Lentini. Here. Trustee Vidot. Here. Here do cues. Here. And now I can explain how the public can participate. Yep. Hey, everyone, <laughs> viewers are welcome to provide public comment online through Zoom or by telephone at 253-215-8782. And the meeting ID is 861-6494. 3820 pound. If you are watching the meeting on Zoom and wish to provide public comment, please select the raise hand feature either on the bottom of your screen or through the participants icon. If you're participating by telephone and wish to provide public comment, please press star nine when the chair opens the public comment period. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you're unmuted, you will have three minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Now, are there any amendments to this evening's agenda? Uh, I guess I will call the first agenda item, approve regular meeting uh, uh, minutes of April 12th, 2022. I can motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. All right, so that was uh, Trustee Cortez and Trustee Hunt. Hunt. Trustee Hunt. Yeah. Okay. Or Hunt. Got it. Thank you. All right. Okay, I will take roll. Trustee Cortez. Aye. Trustee Hahn. Aye. Trustee Lentini. Aye. Trustee Vidot? Aye. Chair DQs? Aye. Um, thank you, Gender. And um, <clears throat> any questions from trustees to staff? And any public comment? Uh, yes, it seems there's there seems to be one attendee, so I'm going to go ahead and read the script. If you wish to provide public comment and are watching this meeting through Zoom, please use the raise hand function to let us know you would like to speak. If you are participating by telephone and wish to provide public comment, please press star nine. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you are unmuted, you will have three minutes to provide your comments. So I'm just going to uh, wait and see if this person is interested. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't seem like they are, so we can continue. Great, thank you. So closing public comments and uh, staff, uh, no need to respond to questions. Okay, so does anybody have any comments, board members? Otherwise, I'll request a motion to approve the agenda items. Can, can we just do that? I guess that just, that happens. So we're doing things in, di in different order. Um, right, so let's move to the second item, introductions, awards, recognitions, presentations. Presentation by Paul Cohen, Library Facilities Planning Update. Okay. Well, thank you and good evening. My name is Paul Cohen. I'm a public affairs consultant, uh, actually based here in San Rafael. And I've been hired along with Charles Heath of TBWBH Props and Measures to 
work with the city of San Rafael on a communications and outreach plan. As you may know, <clears throat> the city council has been evaluating the potential of um, placing a ballot measure on the November ballot to increase San Rafael's existing real estate transfer tax from uh, 0.2 to 1.2% of the uh, sale of real estate um, <clears throat> to use for uh, infrastructure needs. There was, um, there's been, <clears throat> excuse me, there's been talk, you know, for a number of years about um, the potential for building a new library in San Rafael. Um, and frankly, consistent with polling um, all over the Bay Area, I can't speak to other areas, but consistent with polling all over the Bay Area, the public appetite for investing in new library facilities is, is fairly low. Uh, does not meet the threshold for what it would take to pass a successful ballot measure. Uh, a, the city of San Rafael as a charter city has the right to enact a real estate transfer tax or to increase the amount of the existing real estate transfer tax. But there are two types of uh, taxes. One is a special tax. So for example, the city was to say, we're going to impose a tax and we're going to use these funds to build a new library. That would be a special tax and that would require a two thirds vote under the rules enacted as part of Proposition 13. A general tax, which could be used at the council's discretion for a variety of purposes within usually a description of the range of purposes described in the ballot measure, requires a 50% threshold. Uh, unfortunately, I've spoken with the person that did some previous polling on this for San Rafael and uh, building a new library even as a package of other um, investments uh, does not look like it would clear the 50% threshold. So we've been hired to develop a communications and outreach plan for the city over the next couple months to see whether or not there's a uh, package of investments that would uh, make it more likely that the voters would be willing to adopt a general uh, real estate transfer tax in a November election. And um, that's what we're beginning to do outreach. And we wanted to start with folks concerned about the library because we know it somewhat originated with the goal of building a new library. Um, there is support for um, investing in infrastructure in San Rafael. Residents get, you know, San Rafael is one, one of the older cities um, and has a lot of aging infrastructure. Not surprisingly, uh, you know, potholes, streets and sidewalks, storm drains um, rank pretty highly in the voters' list of priorities. But uh, parks are up there, um, parks and recreation services are there, and there does appear to be support for investing in maintaining and upgrading the existing library to meet seismic safety standards and improving some of the uh, space, trying to address some of the space constraints in the existing Carnegie Library. And so our goal is to you know, get some feedback on that as an approach. We'd like to hear what your commission thinks about it. Um, ultimately, we'd love to have all of you out there communicating with residents of San Rafael about the need for this and see whether or not over the next couple months we can uh, build support and the city will likely uh, do a poll after the June election and the council will decide whether or not to place measure on the ballot for November. That decision has to be made just for the timeline purposes. That decision has to be made by the second council meeting in July in order to get the information to the county in early August to qualify measure for the November ballot. So we're dealing with a relatively short time frame uh, if we're going to do something this year. And uh, let me stop there and see if there are questions. I sort of dropped a lot of information on you. I guess I have a question. This is Alex Vidat. Um, in terms of trying to push by November to put a measure on the ballot, what's the um, what's the rationale 
behind doing it now versus like, let's say next year at some point or maybe the year after? Well, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that go into this. I mean, one is that um, all, uh, all elections have been consolidated now through action at the, at the state level in um, even years. And um, it may be a requirement that it's not, I'm not sure this is true for the real estate transfer tax. It may be a requirement that it goes on the ballot when the council's on the ballot. But um, there's certainly a, a, um, a revenue impact, a cost impact. If the city was to hold, for example, a special election, the city of San Rafael would be responsible for the entire cost of conducting that election. and. That can run to. I've uh, worked with the city on on other revenue measures. You know, we're evaluating other revenue measures, and that can run to the hundreds of thousands of dollars. If the city places a measure on the ballot when there are other things on the ballot pertaining to San Rafael, it's the incremental cost of another line on the ballot. So, your best options in terms of keeping the cost down for the city, just the cost of conducting the election that has to be paid to the county registrar's office for the balloting, producing the ballots, conducting the election, all of that, is to hold it in November of an even year, which is when the city uh, elects its council members. So you're talking about this November, you're talking about November of 24 or November of 26. So, um, you know, the the, my understanding is that the need's not going away. Um, and if there's the possibility of, of passing a measure, then the council may decide to go ahead and do it. If not, uh, they may choose to wait. But there, there are certain windows where there are really effectively are opportunities to do this. And we're approaching one of those right now. Paul, can you speak to, you said that there's not an appetite for new libraries across the board in the Bay. Where is that data coming from? And um, just curious where you're getting that, especially I think of Marin County and others recently that have done new libraries and that are even fundraising right now for that, many in Marin. Well, I mean, if you could point me to a community that built a brand new library, I mean, Tiburon, I believe, built a library uh, a few years back, and it took a tremendous amount of fundraising in a very wealthy community. Um, right. Yeah. No, but that, I, I agree. I, I'm just wondering where you're saying the appetite is. Well, from. is it a so, government appetite? Is it a no, no, no? I, I'm talking about conversations I've had with with uh, Brian Godby from Godby Opinion Research, who's done polling around the Bay Area. He's done polling for. City of San Rafael. He's done polling for another number of other municipalities, and there, in, in none of that polling, um, is there a community that seems willing to tax themselves to uh, build a new library. And it, at the rate, it, remember, what we're dealing with here is not. It's not a question of yes, there are some people. There are certainly some people um, interested in improving library facilities. Um, libraries do remain popular, but when it comes to saying, are you willing to tax yourself to have the city build a new library, we don't reach the threshold necessary to pass a measure like that. And they're very, I'm not aware of any community in the Bay Area where um, that's been successful in the last, in recent years. That's a helpful clarification that you're talking about just in, in taxing, not as an appetite in general. Right. Well. Um, yeah, sorry, but I mean, we were hired to help the city evaluate whether or not it's realistic to take a measure to the ballot. So that's in terms of whether or not the city should put, it wouldn't make sense to put something on the ballot unless there was at least a reasonable chance that it could pass. And that's part of um, what we're evaluating. The other part is communications and outreach to try to um, communicate why that would be necessary and what the benefits would be, which will help um, get us to a point where we can do a poll, take the public temperature, and make a recommendation to the council by the end of July. Oh, so you haven't gone to council yet. You're making a recommendation to council? Well, we've been hired by the city. The council has not made any decisions. Okay. There's, there's a council subcommittee. The council has not made any decision whatsoever. They're they're evaluating the potential of doing this, and we're trying to build a communications and outreach program to see whether or not we get to a place where it would make sense to uh, 
to do that. Ultimately, I would assume we'll meet with the <clears throat> with city staff, with the manager and the council subcommittee, and they may choose to take it to the whole council for a vote, um, and they may not. And that sort of remains to be seen. Paul, another clarifying question is the, the question that you were asking or this polling in regards to a new building such as, you know, the B Street or a new downtown or what, I, I guess I'm just clear because I know we did polling before where, you know, people were clear of where their site would want to be, right? And so I'm just curious of was it just in general? Like, are you interested in this new facility or building or was it like in this Parks and Rec and B Street with, you know, a combined? I, I don't believe it was specific to a location. It was, would you support a measure to build a new library? Would you tax yourself to build a new library in Xanderfell, regardless of location? And it did not rise to the level that would be necessary to successfully pass a revenue measure. Right. Regardless of location. I, I do believe there was some A B testing of the of the and Susan and Henry jump in if I'm if I'm misspeaking here. I believe there was a, a bit of A B testing on the Carnegie versus B Street, and there wasn't a significant polling difference. But what we did see a difference is people interested in fixing what they already have. Um, and maintaining the infrastructure we have versus, you know, building something new and fancy, which is why the city has is is now focusing on the Carnegie as our best as the best option to kind of meet what what the community is interested in um, in funding. Well, as Henry and Susan know, this is like a lot of ping ponging for, you know, I've been on for six years and. Henry and all them have been, you know, Henry's been involved since I think the 90s, late 90s when they were doing, they were, talk, they were talking about this. Um, so Susan and Henry and or, and or Catherine, um, is the city council, is the thought that you're going to respond to the city council saying, okay, you know, these are our results, but we do still want to move forward with, with restructuring you know whatever it looks like on carnegie and i don't know if you're going to call it rebuilding but putting money into you know not with a proposition or but with city funds or fundraising to to do the building itself capital funds so i i just want to step back a little because i i feel like maybe some people are confused by the information that we're sharing so i want to make sure that we're hopefully all on the same page. So there was a survey that was done earlier this year, as you know, by Brian Godby Research. And they asked the community, it was a, a statistically valid survey that they asked the community, what types of amenity and infrastructure were they willing to tax themselves to help resolve and improve? And so what Paul's referring to is that summary basically said anything new, the community did not support, not even close. Um, where the greatest support came from the community was fixing what the city already has. Streets, i.e. potholes, sidewalks, infrastructure of an old library, um, parks that needed infrastructure improvements, things like that. So it was pretty <clears throat> obvious that the result of that and what Paul is referencing is Brian has also done many other surveys um, for other agencies that were contemplating libraries. And the same thing has been consistent across other agencies where new libraries are just not gathering the type of support that we need. So as a result of that preliminary survey, city management has hired Paul and uh, Charles Heath to come and do the second phase, which is an education push and an awareness like he is doing tonight with you guys, you good folks. Um, to start pushing the next two months to educate and so that the public is more aware and to find out if by increasing the education and awareness, if that needle will move slightly more to positive. If it does, 
Um, well, let, let me stop right there. So at that point, in a couple of months, Brian Godby would be re-engaged to do a second kind of a midpoint survey to see if that needle has moved sufficiently over that 50%. And I believe Paul has told us it really needs to be like 50 Five percent or fifty. There's a there's a certain delta that it has to cross in order to basically result in at least a, a majority. So if that happens, that information would come back to the city council at that point, saying, "We've done an education awareness. We've done two surveys. This is where we're at. Does the council want to move forward? Does it feel it has enough confidence in moving forward with? Sorry about that. With um, a ballot measure in fall." If the council says yes, then the city will move forward with putting it on the ballot in, in fall and continue the education, and hopefully it will pass. But the council might say it really hasn't moved. We haven't moved that needle significantly. We don't want to take the risk. Let's continue the education and wait for two more years for the next election and really spend the next two years educating the public and hopefully getting them to, uh, you know, obviously a majority vote that would pass it. So that's where we're at right now. And, and I do wanna clarify um, just because the, the question I heard um, maybe was a little unclear here, but the, the library, the, the renovation and expansion of the Carnegie Library is still a part of this proposed tax measure. That would be a major component um, of this funding along with um, pothole, you know, road repairs, sidewalk repairs, storm drains, parks. So um, I, I just want to clarify that it's not like we're scrapping this, the library as a part of this and looking for other funding for it. This is still a, a key component of this transfer tax would, would be, I mean, a, a large percentage of it would go towards funding the library project. Um, so what is the focus of the education awareness over the next two months? Is it to educate the public specifically about the library? Is it about anything that might go in as a project list for if this is passed? Like what is, how is this, what are we educating the public about with regard to trying to get the support for this measure? So there's a, 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 a good question. And um, <clears throat> there's a couple, um, so, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, a, a special tax, which would be one that focused solely on the library, for example, requires two thirds. And honestly, there's there's no scenario that I can see where you get to two thirds, uh, whether you do a public information effort now or you spend the next two years doing it. I, I don't see that in the cards. And just just by way of background, um, so I do. Uh, Outreach and communications. I also uh, run campaigns. Um, Charles and I together ran the city's uh, sales tax measure that was successful, and I ran the library parcel tax measure, the most recent renewal that was also successful. So I'm I'm familiar with revenue measures. I'm currently working for a second round of bond financing for the San Rafael City School. So I'm really familiar with revenue measures in San Rafael what it takes to pass them and, and what's possible and what's uh, less likely. Um, <clears throat> so it's gonna be, a, it's gonna have to of necessity be a general measure, which means it's gotta talk about more than the library. Um, <clears throat> where we're going is stressing that, you know, San Rafael is one of California's oldest cities and there are streets, sidewalks, bridges, storm drains, parks and libraries constructed as San Rafael grew throughout the last century there's a lot of aging infrastructure that needs repair and improvement. And we're gonna talk about, uh, you know, streets needing pothole repair and repaving, bailing storm drains, and older public buildings like the San Rafael Library, which were built in 1909, that don't meet current seismic safety standards, accessibility standards, and don't have space for summer reading classes and other programs for children's family and seniors. And that's kind of the core message that we're going to put out there and see whether or not. So that's sort of a package of investments in San Rafael's infrastructure and see whether or not um, that's enough to get people thinking that that's an investment that they want to make. 
the decision about um, you know how the revenue that this measure generates um, gets divided up will be uh, made by the city council. And that is the nature of a general tax because it's not earmarked for a specific thing. So obviously fans and supporters of the library would want to encourage the council to spend a significant percentage of the revenue on the library needs, but that's a decision that gets made after the measure is adopted and there's revenue. If there's no revenue, there's no decision to make there. Um, I want to say, I thought Susan did a great uh, summary. The, the only thing I do want to mention is that, that if the council decides to put something on the ballot, the, the public education portion uh, stops being a city function. Um, this is going to work because the, once, a, once a measure is on the ballot, it's political and you no public funds can be used to promote it. So, for example, I mentioned the, the school bond campaign that we're currently working on. We advised the city of San Rafael, the San Rafael City Schools, rather, about whether or not it was possible to put a bond measure on the ballot and get it passed. And they made a decision to place it on the ballot. And then the district officially stepped back. And we're now, we've been hired by a campaign committee that is fundraising and promoting the measure to pass it. And that's going to be on the June ballot. This would be a similar model. So I just wanted to clarify that mm -hmm. if the council decides to put it on the ballot, once they make that decision, there's no more public funds spent on communications and outreach. Um, so another question on the poll that was just done. If I understand what a transfer tax is correctly, it, it only kicks in when you sell real estate. So the only time the tax you would incur the tax is if you sold property. Did people understand that when that poll was done, when the poll that was done was just done? Did they actually, did they really understand what it meant when they were saying, yes, I'll, I'll, I'm willing to be taxed? Did they understand when it actually might or might not ever hit them? Um, I believe that they probably did. Yes. Um, I've also, Recently, they've been working with City of Belvedere that's considering a similar, their situation is a little more complicated, um, but they've been uh, considering a, a similar approach. And um, <clears throat> I, I believe that, you know, the, the term is a, a tax on real property sales. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty clear that that that's a tax that is imposed when you're selling property, any real estate. Um, the question of, of, by the way, the question of, of who pays it um, seems to be a little murky. The, the, the consensus um, among attorneys is it's sort of joint and several. The city can't say, oh, the buyer pays the tax or the seller pays the tax. It becomes a function of the real estate deal and the parties involved and, you know, but there's a tax on the transaction when it happens at the selling price. Um, the city is able to estimate, you know, revenue, um, and it appears that uh, based on recent sales in the city of San Rafael, a 1.2% uh, real estate transfer tax in San Rafael would generate about $9 million annually. Um, and it's most likely to be for a duration of nine years and then would need to be renewed. So it would generate over that span, you know, around $80 million, not a, not a bad sum of money. Yeah, there was some feedback from the first survey um, that asked about the term length and the initial feedback that we got from the community was, if I remember correctly, there was a couple of questions posed, which was in perpetuity until, you know, basically overturned by voters or for a certain amount of time. And so the results of that survey, the experts basically told us, look, the nine years is the sweet spot. That's, that's where the community is going to feel support, supportive, especially, you know, you've got other major stakeholders that either come out and support or oppose um, tax measures like this, and they are much more uh, supportive of measures that have a set term like nine years, sure. rather than, you know, 30 years or in perpetuity until overturned. Uh, 
Um, I have a question. So uh, you mentioned a few of the uh, areas that this um, initiative is focusing on. Um, I hear a lot of concern, not so much about some of those areas, but about housing and the cost of living and the current economic downturn that we're facing and likely uh, will be, you know, not a short-term thing. So, you know, the, the public already was reluctant to be taxed further than they already are. So um, curious as to how you, the education push is balancing those other concerns that from my perspective, listening to the the community may be, you know, more, um, may have more weight and, um, and, and, and how is this, you know, different to, or, or how this may result in something different to the previous survey, given the economic conditions are worse right now. Right, so, so let me parse that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, clearly, um, you know, inflation is a greater concern, but even then when the, um, when the uh, initial poll was done. So certainly the idea that there's gonna be a, what we would call a tracking poll, another poll done after this outreach effort, um, I would not recommend going forward without doing that because a poll is a snapshot in time and we would wanna see whether the numbers uh, supported you know, a reasonable chance of success. Um, you know, there's a, um, there's certainly a value judgment uh, to be made about whether or not uh, increasing taxes on real estate um, drives the housing affordability crisis. Um, my sense is I'm not convinced that it does. I think the market drives that. Um, and I don't know that a 1% tax on the sale of real estate is going to make uh, housing affordable or not affordable in San Rafael. Currently not affordable, and I don't think myself, I'm not sure that that 1% is going to be the, the tipping point. Um, the other piece of that, and I think, you know, encouraging for those that want to see investment in the library, for example, is that voters in San Rafael you know, have consistently shown a willingness to invest by taxing themselves for things that they think um, enhance their experience of living in this community. Um, housing, by the way, not so much one of those. Uh, there was an effort that I was uh, consulting with on a countywide uh, housing measure that would have been a, a sales tax measure to fund housing in Marin County and that did not rise to the level of being prudent to take to the ballot. Um, but <clears throat> for example, the, the decision to um, put the school, another round of school bonds on the ballot um, was a pretty straightforward decision. Voters were willing to invest in um, enhancements to schools, even though they've already seen a lot of work recently done. They understood there's more work to be done and they were willing to make that investment because they think good schools in San Rafael are important. So if we make the case here um, that investing in San Rafael's infrastructure, including in library facilities is important, I think voters may be willing to, uh, to make that investment. Okay. I imagine it's going to be uh... Not an easy task. I wouldn't want to sugarcoat it. Um, and uh, no, I, I think, um, and Susan kind of alluded to this, if, if based on the polling as it was done, um, I probably would not recommend going forward. But the language of the polling clearly said new library. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things that's going to be different is communication and outreach about what this investment is going to be in and not talking about a new library and having it be a general tax and seeing whether or not, um, <clears throat> and again, um, I've worked on a number of ballot measures and they, uh, they, they rarely start at a place and go up from the polling. They, they usually start where the polling says, and then you hang on for dear life, trying to keep those numbers 
and get over the finish line. So yeah, you wouldn't want to start with a pole that was right at 50% and see whether or not you could pass it. Um, still cost to the city to place a measure on the ballot. Um, you know, a lot of work to pass a ballot measure um, by folks who are motivated to see it happen, um, including hopefully all of you. Um, and so it's not something you want to take on lightly and it's not something you want to take on unless you have a, a you know, nothing's guaranteed, but unless you have a reasonable chance of success. So uh, I, I would think a, a package of infrastructure investments that motivates voters um, is possible, but we're going to have to see it and we're going to have to see polling that supports that or I yeah. can make a recommendation to the city to move forward. And, and I, I mentioned housing, but I, I didn't necessarily mean being taxed to provide affordable housing because that that's not necessarily what I'm hearing. The concern is the concern is we have, you know, uh, a, a crisis of people without housing in the city. And so how are some of our tax dollars going toward that is what um, I think people are balancing out as they think of improvements in the community. So it's just curious how that's all being put together. Uh, tell people make a decision around how they want their taxes to be used. I understood, and 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 that's a um, that's a policy decision that I was not hired to make. Mm -hmm. uh, we elected a council, the mayor, and they get to make those choices. I believe um, that part of the package, if I remember correctly, there was some language that we were looking at to include addressing homelessness. Mm -hmm. Now, I i don't know what that actually means on whether that is hiring, you know, using that money for resources and case management or what it is, but it, it homelessness was added to the measure um, because it is obviously a major concern for the community and, um, and management felt it was important to include it in this tax measure. I think the biggest challenge, I think everything on the list, if we were to go out to the community, there's not anyone in the community who wouldn't feel um, supportive of, of trying to address the long list of elements that are that comprise this or com this list is comprised of. I think the biggest thing, and Cheryl mentioned it, is really explaining to people that this is a transactional tax. I've already heard where people go, I don't want to pay more property tax or I don't want to pay a parcel tax. They don't understand this. It's a very unusual tax. And so, you know, getting that out there where it only happens when basically a property is flipped, when you either sell residential or commercial, most people will go, you know what, okay, if I'm selling the house, whether I'm paying it or the buyer pays it, it's a one-time deal, um, I, I can deal with that. But, you know, un unfortunately, um, trying to have that kind of intimate conversation with over 50,000 people to make sure that they completely understand it and not confuse it with a property tax or a parcel tax that they're gonna pay on an annual basis is really the biggest hurdle. Cause I think if people understood it's a one-time deal that they're going to possibly experience if they sell their house or sell and buy another house in San Rafael, I think they'd be very supportive of this. And, and by the way, um, early on when we spoke with Brian, when the city engaged with Brian Godby, we asked him for the advice of what tax measures could the city really look at um, to achieve the support that is needed to address the library, the streets, et cetera. And there's not a whole lot left um, that the city really can take advantage of. And some of them require a super majority, right? They require two thirds of vote. Um, I think we're already at our sales tax top. I think that measure R just took us to that. So there's not a lot of little tools in our tool belt anymore, but this is a good one. Um, if we can really educate the public and they understand fully what it is, um, you know, we, we have a fighting chance. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with all of that and, and definitely need to, and we will be communicating in the, in the outreach plan that we're putting together, talking about the fact that it's a property transfer tax only paid when a property is bought or sold. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Any other questions from trustees? Questions from the public? Uh, yes, we do have an attendee still, so I'll go ahead and read the script. 
If you wish to provide public comment and are watching this meeting through Zoom, please use the raise hand function to let us know you would like to speak. If you're participating by telephone and wish to provide public comment, please press star nine. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you're unmuted, you will have three minutes to provide your comments. And I'm just gonna see if this person is interested. Uh, it doesn't look like they are, so we can continue. Thank you, Jinder. So closing public comment. Um, so let's move on to our next agenda item. Presentation by Matthew Hurley, Outreach to the Services Support Area. Thank you, Paul. Right. Thank you for the Thanks, opportunity. Paul. Nice talking to you all. Good night. Okay. okay. Hello, everybody. Um, Henry and Jinder, should I share the presentation from my screen or would one of you like to do it? Uh, you can share your screen. Okay. How is everybody doing today? While I get this all set up, let's see. Ooh. Okay. Okay, are we seeing my shared screen at this juncture? Um, we're seeing the presenter mode rather than the presentation. Oh, perfect. Let's see. I think if you put it in presentation mode and then share. Right, <laughs> totally. I just learned that recently, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It works. Okay. Is that looking right for everybody? It is. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so my name is Matthew Hurley. I am a librarian at the primarily at the downtown branch. I also work at our Northgate location on the weekends. Um, and I have been working recently um, in recent months to uh, do some outreach at our service support area here in San Rafael. Um, but to get started, let's run through what what that means. So the service support area is a um, site that the city established in 2021, in August of 2021. Um, it's situated under the 101 freeway overpass. Um, and it's an area that is basically designed to provide access to restrooms, social services, um, and sanctioned camping locations for people experiencing uh, shelterlessness. Um, the site was designed to accommodate 50 residents um, and has been at its capacity for a long time um, so that it's you know, a fully utilized site in that regard. And as the library was thinking about how to best engage our community and the most vulnerable, vulnerable people in our community, we saw that there was this place where people experiencing shelterlessness were um, you know, all in one geographic location. Um, and we wanted to use that as an opportunity. Um, and the reasons that we thought about this is, um, the library has this mission of trying to close the digital divide um, and provide access to information for everyone um, that is part of our community. And we saw an opportunity to work towards those ends. Um, we also identified what we saw as a very vulnerable community in San Rafael and wanted to do something to have a positive impact. Um, and we're interested in expanding the library's presence in all the parts of our community. I think especially in light of 
how hampered, you know, library programming has been during the pandemic. We haven't been able to physically go to locations. Um, I think it's easy for people, for us to like atrophy from people's minds. And so this is part of our effort to be visible and present in the overall community, uh, which is something we finally have the opportunity to do again. Um, and so we took these objectives and um, basically put together a twice monthly outreach program where we go to the service support area. This started in April of 2022. So I believe we just had our third session this last Friday. Um, and when we go to the service support area, um, we bring books and literature for people to enjoy. Um, we also bring some of our Chromebooks from the library along with a Wi-Fi hotspot. And people have the opportunity to utilize access to internet that otherwise would be absent in this location. Um, at the turn of the year, we worked to update our community resources flyer. The previous flyer was from 2016. I'd say a few things have probably changed in the meantime. So we went through and basically contacted all those organizations, made sure they were still functioning, did some research about new organizations in the community. Um, and this has been a huge boon for us. So we're able to take this a pamphlet that's pictured here and hand it to people. And it provides about 200 different organizations that um, can help people with housing, with getting access to showers, with getting access to low cost phone plans. You know, a wide range of potential needs are addressed by these flyers that we bring. This is an opportunity to hand these things right into, like give them right to people. Um, Whereas normally they'd be at the library where they might be a little harder to find if someone's not explicitly looking for them. Um, we've also taken this opportunity to um, engage our new community wellness assistant, um, Jennifer. She's been coming down every single time and has had this opportunity to take the skills that she's learned working with Lynn Murphy and really have meaningful conversations with people living at the service support area around the specific needs that they have, getting them connected with resources in the community um, and having those one-on-one -on -one human conversations. We've taken water there. There's no running water at the site. So it's something that people always need. Um, and also through uh, a generous gift from our friends of the San Rafael Library, we were able to acquire some dry bags, which you'll see at the next, um, on the next slide, <coughs> basically to give people the opportunity to, um, you know, we're handing out books and things. We want to also give people the opportunity to be able to check those things out and enjoy them, but, you know, to do so in a way that doesn't lead to damage to library materials. Um, so that's kind of the range of things that we tried to offer there. We're also having conversations with people to adjust what resources we provide on the basis of what people express to us that they need. And so all of that is to say that um, so far we've had a really great response from the people that we've had conversations with and have provided resources for at the service support area um, and has our, already, you know, Conver those conversations have already allowed us to start tweaking the types of things that we're bringing with us so that we can provide the best support possible. Um, we've had the opportunity to provide books to people, access to people, and support to people um, that otherwise might have gone by the wayside. And as we move forward, um, we hope to provide more programming at the location as long as it's open. You know, the city doesn't plan for this to be a permanent location, but as long as there's people there, we would like to continue to lend support to those that are there. Um, and so leading into that, I'd be super curious if anyone has any questions, anything that they'd be, um, you know,
curious to know about in regards to this particular program. No questions at Matthew. I just want to say thank you for this. I think it's great outreach. And I think since you've come on, I've seen and heard new things that you've implemented and done at the library, um, thinking, you know, new ways um, of outreach and really, you know, appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hi, I'm Matthew. I just wanted to ask, um, <clears throat> what uh, what services are the folks at the SSA looking? Oh. <laughs> sorry, dealing with a toddler on one no thing here. Uh, what what's what services are folks looking uh, looking for? Yeah, so um, a lot of the services that people are looking for, unsurprisingly, is getting connections with housing. Um, the city is trying to work with the people that are at the location to acquire housing vouchers. Um, there's, I don't know the whole apparatus of it, but there's some state funds that have opened up to help with housing vouchers. Um, but this is also why it's so beneficial that we're able to take our uh, community resources person, Jennifer, with us because she has a great understanding of those kinds of resources and can really, um, direct people, you know, to the pathways to get towards those types of resources. The other major thing we provide is, you know, actually that we bring water there. The site lacks running water, it's hot. Um, and unfortunately, that's just a deficit of the specific location. Um, and people are really grateful for that. And I would say the final thing that people have expressed to us is that there's just surprised that the library provides so much stuff and has brought it right to them. Um, and so I think, you know, the last thing that I'm really appreciating that we're giving people is the knowledge that the library really wants to provide assistance to them. Um, hi, Matthew. Um, I think this is amazing. Um, I just had a question, is this just um, library staff going out or are you, are is there volunteers that join you or, I mean, do you see, do you see a need for more people to, to do that activity with you? Yeah, so we have actually, for our first three sessions, we've had three staff members go. Um, we actually decided that, you know, that was more than sufficient. We have a really efficient way of setting up and tearing down and um, we get everything prepared the day beforehand. So it's pretty quick to get out the door and go over there. And we're actually planning to take the program to doing it with two staff members instead of three, just because we found that there was a little bit of idle time for three staff members at once. We do, it helps that we go at the same time mm -hmm. as a street chaplaincy in San Rafael they bring breakfast for people, um, you know, and so that's been really helpful because they have a lot of cachet with the community and have, you know, let people know that we're people that can be trusted um, and have good intentions. Um, but in regards to additional uh, labor or anything, I actually think we're in a pretty good place for our specific program, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure if you contacted the Ritter Center, they might have opportunities though for different kinds of outreach from what we're specifically doing. Okay, thanks. That's great. I agree, that's great, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from trustees or comments from the public? Uh, we do still have one attendee, um, so I'll go ahead and read the script. If you wish to provide public comment and are watching this meeting through Zoom, please use the raise hand function to let us know you would like to speak. If you are participating by telephone or wish to provide public comment, please press, the star, please press star nine. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you're unmuted, you have three minutes to provide your comments. Let's see if this person's interested. No, it doesn't seem like they're interested. So we can continue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank Jenna. you very much for everyone for your uh, time and attention. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Matthew. 
See you at the library. <laughs> great job. That was really great. Um, great. So I will move on to our next item, public comment from the audience regarding items not listed on the agenda. Speakers are encouraged to limit comments to three minutes. All right. Uh, yes. Uh, I'll go ahead and read the script once more. We do, do still have an attendee. If you wish to provide public comment and are watching this meeting through Zoom, please use the rain, raise hand function to let us know you're, you would like to speak. If you're participating by telephone and wish to provide public comment, please press star nine. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you're unmuted, you will have three minutes to provide your comments. Okay, let's see if this person is interested. No, it doesn't seem like they're interested. Thank you, Jinder. All right, so I'll close that public comment. And then the next item is fiscal year 2021-2022, third quarter annual revenue and expenditure budget report. Oh, Henry, you're on mute. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Adriana. <laughs> um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, can everyone see my screen? Awesome. So this is uh, our review of the third quarter library budget for the current fiscal year 21-22. Um, we do this quarterly. Um, this provides the year-to-date figures for general fund and parcel tax. As of this report, the year is 75% elapsed. So, so a lot of our um, targeting whether things are over or underspent is based on the idea that, you know, ideally all the budget categories would be 75% expended, which almost never happens, but that's our target. So overall, the activity is 70% expended. Uh, general fund expenditures were close to on target of 74%. Parcel tax is under at 59%. Uh, the general fund expenditure is lower due to staff vacancies, and the parcel tax expenditure is significantly lower due to staff vacancies and the fact that we're spending down the general fund budget before the parcel tax. So, um, Generally, the overall budget as conceived of for the entire year, 71% of that is general fund and 28% partial tax and a little less than 1% is the friends, uh, friends contribution. The revenue um, is estimated to be for the general fund um, 12,200 which is largely uh, money we get from the North Net Consortium as the, the California Library um, State Library gives us money, a small amount of money every year. Uh, Friends of the Library contribution. The last report we did was it was it was it was about ten thousand dollars off. It's about ten thousand more than we thought, about thirty three thousand eight hundred and fifteen for this year. And then the revenue from the parcel tax is estimated for this year to be 1,100,000 and something. Um, it's always a moving target because we're constantly having people submit um, waivers. So they, so they, if you're over 65 and live in your own home, you can file an exemption and not have to pay the $59-ish um, Measure D parcel tax assessment. And then every year around this time, um, that uh, parcel tax assessment it can rise by up to 3%, depending upon the cost of living. And it's definitely rising this year because the cost of living is going up. So expenditure highlights, general fund, uh, as I said, regular higher salaries and benefits expenditures are lower due to vacancies. Extra higher, consequently, are fully extended in general fund and we're being depleted in the parcel tax 
because when we don't have regular hire positions um, filled, we we rely more on temporary workers, of which we have a large number. Um, so the savings from that regular hire uh, category will will be able to flow into temporary hire. Uh, contract services are fully expended in the general fund, as the general fund is being depleted before the parcel tax, the savings from regular hire again will be used utilized for additional funding in contract services. Again, that's where our Marin net um, bill comes from and usually it hits us in the first quarter so it's always pretty much over over spent or fully expended. Books expenditures are fully expended and then uh, as the annual fund is being depleted before parcel tax and we have a ton in parcel tax that we'll be spending also. Audio visual in general fund is fully expended. And again, um, we have additional um, funds in books and periodicals to, to put towards audio visual if needed. Travel and conference and training instruction has been underspent over the past year because of COVID. But California Library Association is in um, Sacramento this year and we tend and tend to send a lot of people to that and um, most of the expenditures will be hitting this fiscal year so we'll be able to spend that down um professional dues and subscriptions we've been um not really re-upping for professional associations for which we're not going to the conference but but that um will also be able to be spent towards um the cla conference um, which you know we're very excited to be sent spending so many people this year it's in Sacramento every year it rotates usually between north and south and um, credit card fees are low because we we do most patrons use the online catalog to pay fees and we don't do that many in-person transactions especially since we have fewer people in general in the library um, even since we've gone back to regular hours our before COVID, daily door count was around 500 plus, and we're more hovering a little between, a little over 300 and not quite to 400 on the most busiest day. Um, expenditure highlights parcel tax. Again, extra higher expenditures are significantly higher due to coverage for vacant positions. Um, contract expenditures line is not budgeted, but in this line in the parcel tax we used to spend for our project that for library preservation, renovation and expansion, i.e. the new library. Um, within this line, we would charge to the measure C capital set aside for things like, like the contract with Nolan Tam, which we have a small amount we'll be paying this fiscal year and the uh, survey with Godby Research, the survey that was done in February. Um, so finance uh, uh, applies those expenditures towards the end of the fiscal year. Programming supplies are underspent because we haven't been doing a lot of programming, but we're really excited that we are starting to do story time at all three locations outside. I think the mall story time, the first one will be tomorrow, Wednesday, in, in an area between the mall and Kohl's. Uh, books and expenditures are underspent, but these funds are continually monitored, and we are spending as fast as we can before the cutoff, which comes up soon, uh, because there's a delay between when we spend book money and when we receive those items. Um, periodicals are fully expended. Um, digital branch is slightly underspent, but we're continually be monitoring that and we tend to spend a lot from that line on ebooks sent at the end of the year. We've overspent on uh, technology. Uh, we replaced everyone's extremely tiny monitors with with larger monitors um, and in in sync with updating a lot of staff computers which were paid for by the digital services, but they weren't paying for the monitors. And then training instruction is underspent due to the many free trainings available, but we can also draw on this budget line to um, for our um, upcoming um, California Library Association conference 
expenditures. Uh, that ends my presentation today, and I will stop sharing my screen. Comments and questions? Uh, really excited uh, staff for doing two presentations at CLA this year. I'm good. I just appreciate the, uh, the quick and dirty run through. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Uh, Henry, the, the two presentations at the CLA, do you know the content already? Uh, yes, um, but I can. T I should talk more about that during the uh, director's report. I'm sorry, I, from a from a strict agendized. Okay. Yeah, but I will tell yes. you more. Don't remind me not to forget. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions from trustees? From the public? All right, yes, we still do have one attendee. If you wish to provide public comment and are watching this meeting through Zoom, please use the raise hand function to let us know you would like to speak. If you are participating by telephone or wish to provide public comment, please press star nine. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you're unmuted, you will have three minutes to provide your comments. Okay, let's see if this person's interested. It doesn't seem like they are, so we can continue. Thank you, Gender. All right, closing public comments, and let's move on to our next item. Other brief reports on any meetings, conferences, and seminars attended by board members. Parks and Recreation Master Plan Steering Committee. I guess I'm on that. Um, mm -hmm. We, I think we've got a meeting coming up, another meeting coming up toward the end of May. Um, there was a first introductory meeting and I know that there are surveys out now for the public to take about, you know, what what you like or what you like about the parks and what you know about our parks. And I've been seeing that out and about. So I'm hoping people are are responding to it. And I'm looking forward to seeing what what comes back at the next meeting. But I think it's at I think it's the last week of this month is our next meeting. So we'll kind of get to see um, what the next steps are in the process. That's great. Yeah, that was, I think, really well marketed. I saw it at the local park. I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I was store. pretty pleased. Yeah, I saw it a lot of places too, which I usually don't when I know there's a survey out that, you know, I'm aware of. And this one is really well marketed. I think it's a good job. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I hope people actually took the time to respond. Um, because it must have reached a lot of people. <laughs> it's just them, them going and taking the time to respond, but, um, but it, was, it was a good survey. Um, great. Any questions or, or comments from trustees? Right, moving on to our next item. Thank you, Trustee Lentini. <laughs> um, okay, so item six, other brief program updates or report on any meetings, conferences, and or seminars attended by staff. Henry. Yes, um, the Friends of the Library Board didn't meet, we didn't meet with them last month. They had their retreat, their meeting tomorrow. So no update from them. So uh, they're very excited about an upcoming lawn sale um, in June. And they're having um, an event at the store on the 19th. See me for more info. Um, the NorthNet board, which is the, the official state library consortium of which we're a part from which we get um, money every year and um, which stretches from Marin to the Oregon border and over to Nevada and down to Sacramento, hasn't met, um, but we'll be meeting in June about uh, one of the big topics on the agenda is sharing between our ebook platform, 
the NorthNet one and one in Peninsula Library System, which requires all, all the official boards to kind of approve. So that will be exciting. Um, Measure D Parcel Tax Committee is meeting on the 24th of this month and hasn't met since last quarter to review the budget presentation I just gave to you. Um, and then, you know, the other big thing Measure D does is write a report at the end of the calendar year, at the last calendar year in December. Um, they write a report about whether and how the expenditures of that a million dollars from the parcel tax, whether they were expended according to the law. And then MarinNet uh, met the first week of the month and there was much discussion about a shared dashboard that anal that analyzes um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion of the library collection. And it's through uh, Baker and Taylor's um, Collection HQ platform, which we were planning to purchase individually. The county has already purchased that. It's a collection analysis tool, but it would give us the ability as an entire county to kind of look at the entire collection that we all own sort of in together and separately and analyze, you know, how well it reflects diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then to purchase things through that specific vendor, it's kind of the, that's why they're selling it to us, but, but it's, you know, extremely useful and will be the first time we've been able to sort of have a dashboard of our entire collection together which is great. Um, also that we're looking at retooling the cost sharing formula. Like every time I give the budget presentation, I say that the contract services line is overspent because the Marin net bill of 250,000 has hit us the first part of the year, which, which is, you know, we're paying like double what other libraries with the, the same collection sizes are paying within Marin Net, but because we have a larger population, so the way that the cost sharing formula is calculated could be changed. But even greater than that, we could look at efficiencies in, in the way Marin Net operates, which I think will, would also bring down the cost because as an individual library, if we were to contract out for the same services, we would be paying like a, a quarter of what we're paying to Marinet. So so the economy the this sort of you would think working together would bring costs down. So it's not working that way, but we're working on it. Very excited to have a little progress here. So we're doing a survey of the members to kind of get their thoughts about the cost sharing formula. And the CLA conference is in the early part of June. Catherine's going, I'm going. Uh, several of our supervisors are going, um, a bunch of frontline staff, librarians, senior library assistants, and library assistants. We're able, we're able to get um, scholarships for non-librarian staff this year, which is great. The community wellness assistant, Jennifer Madrid, and Lynn Murphy, and the dog, Blue, the comfort animal that... Uh, works with dispatch are all going as part of a presentation called um, community wellness and comfort dog library and police collaboration and that's me that will be presenting about the new community wellness uh, assistant helping to proactively promote wellness instead of using a security guard and bringing the dog to sort of symbolize a alternate approaches to wellness and and kind of you know what we've been doing as a city working with directly with police and library and the community to kind of you know like what Matthew was talking about you know work proactively to kind of address challenges around people experiencing homelessness and just behavioral challenges in general that varies from that sort of security guard and enforcement like a lens to a more kind of proactively knowing the community, promoting resources, stuff like that. Very excited. And then our other presentation will be Basha Alejandra, our former supervisor, Jamie Poirier, who's a deputy county librarian for public services at, Con at Solano County, and me um, talking about preferred, not required, second time with feeling. We did this at the virtual conference last year, 
but we're going to talk about why removing the requirement for the librarian degree to be a librarian at our library it's preferred not required you can you know still have a library degree. we still value the library degree but there's other ways to get that experience it's allowed us to to promote from within to provide a continuous pathway of promotion Basha and Alejandra are both librarians without the library degree and are like one some of our most talented staff who are invaluable to the organization and we'll be sort of talking about that it's somewhat controversial and we anticipate a bit of sort of dialogue in the Q&A for example the ALA president Patty Wong spoke to our consortium recently she's the library director for the Santa Clara City Library and when asked directly her opinion about you know the role of the library library degree for, to be a librarian and how that affects equity, diversity, inclusion. She she couldn't really be quoted officially because ALA as an organization is sort of invested in, you know, people going to library school in, in an interesting sort of way, you know. So so it's it's going to be very exciting to talk about this because because it I think, you know, gets at sort of some of the root causes for for like not being able to kind of be a responsive organization and promote people because of them being awesome at their job versus having the specific degree shout out to the city for taking the lead in this and then the, the thir third thing i'm part about is is a um, statewide ebook project a free ebook platform with the palaces project which is named after the book palaces for the people supported by lyricist library consortium and our state library uh in sacramento should be exciting um that concludes my remarks thank you henry any comments or questions henry are you slated for um I don't know, July to um, bring your learnings from the conference? Yes, um, I believe what we're going to do is have everyone contribute. So, um, you know, all of the staff are attending and learning. There's a wide variety of, um, but that, that would be a great uh, presentation idea for, for one of the um, board meetings you know, after the conference, July, August, somewhere in there. Awesome. Thank you for the idea. Great. And here, just as a comment, the world is moving towards skills as opposed to certificates and degrees. So that's the right, <laughs> the right move. Sorry for all of us who have certificates and degrees. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll be in trouble then if that's the case. Same. <laughs> But it is, it is really the right thing because skills are evolving so fast that whatever skills I earned in my degree, if I'm not keeping up to date, might be irrelevant. So it's more about keeping up to date and some, some skills don't require a degree anymore, a four-year degree. So lots of um, opportunity there. So good to be, uh, to know that we're keeping with the times. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Henry. Any other comments or questions from trustees or from the public? Uh, no, we don't have any attendees right now. Okay, so that concludes our meeting for today. Our next meeting is June 14. And um, no future agenda items yet. So happy to adjourn and thank everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Adriana. Right, thank Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine.